Hello, I'm Justin Warland. I'm a senior correspondent at Time Magazine, where I write about climate change and policy, uh, the intersection of policy and politics and society. I'm really thrilled to be here today at the IMF talking about the new chapter two of the Global Financial Stability Report, scaling up private climate finance in emerging markets uh, and developing economies. It almost goes without saying that emerging markets and developing countries are essential to getting the world uh, on a sustainable emissions trajectory. Uh, as the report highlights, they contribute two thirds of emissions and in many cases are the most vulnerable uh, places. And yet private capital isn't flowing, uh, not nearly at the degree necessary. And so we're gonna dig into all of that with this excellent group of panelists. Uh, we have Fabio uh, Daralucci, who is a deputy director of the, uh, of the fund and, uh, excuse me, of Deputy, Deputy Director of the Monetary and Capital Markets Department at the fund, excuse me, uh, and he's responsible for the Global Financial Stability Report. Yep. Uh, next, we have Vivek uh, Pathak, who is the International Finance Corporation's Global Head and Director of Climate Business. Uh, and then we have Helen uh, uh, Mirovich, who is the Head of Climate Change at IDB Invest, uh, and she, where she leads the Climate Change Advisory Services team. We're also going to be joined, uh, I hope, by Sonia Gibbs, who is Managing Director, Managing Director and Head of Sustainable Finance at the Inst Institute of International Finance. She'll be joining us from London shortly. Uh, so Fabio, let's just start with you very broadly. If you could give us a sense of the chapter, what are the findings, uh, what, are, you know, what is the scene set that we should have from the report? So as, as you said, like two thirds of the carbon emission now come from emerging markets. So clearly if you want to address the issue we need to think about how to address the uh, emission in emerging markets. Uh, we also know that coming out of COVID, uh, these countries have very high level of debt. The external financial conditions are tightening as normalization of monetary policy proceed. So it's going to be very hard to actually address this just with public funding. So private finance need to play an important role, private climate finance here, in addressing uh, climate challenge transition. Now, how do we do that? I think the important is to set in place the right investment climate, right? And this has different components of that. One has to do with the right climate policies. It's important to get pricing of carbon. So whether this comes through carbon pricing, obviously, different countries have taken different approach, subsidies, but the important is to have climate policies in place. The second part is to think about what we have called the climate information architecture. You need climate data that to be good quality, they have to be comparable across countries, they have to be available. Uh, the second piece is uh, classification or taxonomies. Uh, you need some definition here, some common accepted definition across markets. And then you need disclosure. Ideally, you want a global disclosure so that investor, particularly global investor, can actually benefit from, from this approach. Now, there are a number of challenges uh, or barriers to this. Some have to do with the demand for capital, some has to do with supply of capital, if you want. Right? So demand for capital is, I don't know, the availability of project uh, off the shelf, uh, project risk and then emerging market risk, broadly speaking, macroeconomic, political risk, legal risk, institutional risk. There are also barriers on the supply of funding. Uh, one is like, for example, is the appropriate return. So for what is bankable, is the return high enough to attract private investors? Uh, another one is how to do pooling. How do you diversify? Some of these investors have large portfolio. They don't want to go into specific individual projects. Uh, some of these deals are very bespoke and slow to come up. And so how do you scale them up in a way that you scale up and you, you can actually provide enough capital? And then there are other issues. For example, there are no specific slots in some of these other locations, right? There's either sometimes green or brown, but there's no decarbonization slot, for example, right? So how do you incentivize the transition? So what with the chapter does, think about those are the challenges if you want. And then think about what are the opportunities? How do we get there? And so one is we need to broaden the set of financial instruments, right? We need to think creatively and think about specific new creative financial instruments that can actually help scale up. Whether this is green bonds, whether this is sustainability bonds, sustainability linked bonds, and there's a long list of instruments in the chapter that we go through. Uh, the second component of this, we need to broaden the investor base, right? We need to try to bring in as much possible prior capital. And so there's different kinds of capital from institutional investor, investment fund, from uh, say private equity, private debt, philanthropic capital, impact capital. We need all of them if you want to scale up this quickly uh, and in sufficient, uh, sufficient size. The third part is the role that multilateral development banks can play, right? Both in terms of like possibly an idealist increasing the balance sheet that they can allocate to this, 
uh, but also increasing the leverage that you can use in terms of risk absorption capacity, right? So for given size of the MDBs, how much private capital they're able to bring to emerging markets. Uh, there's an issue also in thinking about improving, again, the climate information architecture. So we need better data, we need more data, more reliable, more consistent. We need transition taxonomies so that this, the taxonomies set up the right incentive for investors, not just to say something is green or non-green, but something if it's greenish, how do I make it more green over time? How do I set the incentive for this? And then finally, we look at the role the IMF can play uh, in this, in this uh, attempt to scale up private finance with the new resilient sustainability trust that was just introduced. Excellent. That is, that's quite an overview, and I, I'll say the chapter really does uh, synthesize everything in a, in a digestible way. It was uh, very, very good to read. Um, I just, before, I want to spend most of this conversation talking about, you know, how do you address these, these challenges? How do you actually scale up uh, climate finance? But I do want to just before we do that, talk a little bit more about the barriers, and you laid many of them out, Fabio, but Vivek, and then Ilan, I want to just hear from you. What do you see as the primary barriers uh, to uh, scaling up climate, uh, private finance? Sure, well, thanks so much. And I think the irony is today that you've got trillions or hundreds of billions of dollars saving money coming to climate, and then you've got a market saying we are staffed for funds. So how do we really bridge that gap? So I think Fabio mentioned four points the need for policies, the need for taxonomies, the need for transparency, and the need for data. Now, if we try and get a little more granular, what do you really need? The global investors want a certain risk return profile. Emerging markets cannot always offer that. Yeah. So how do you bridge that risk return profile? Now, I, I'm a believer, I can understand when you do an infrastructure project and your off taker is the government, there is a sovereign risk element. You can't change that. Yeah. So that, that's a given. But if you look at a lot of market products, if you look at steel and cement, the technologies are known. You're not taking any technology risk here. Yeah. Your market risk is the same, I would argue, in most markets. So you can assess that. So we need, what we need is clearly that investors also need to start re-looking at the risk appetites. Yeah. You know, what is really risky? How do you work around some of these things? At the same time, what we need from governments is to try and make their projects as bankable. Now that doesn't mean, and the way it's been done in the past is you have government guarantees for a lot of things. Governments are trying to move away from that. They've got a lot of debt they're carrying after COVID. So we need to sort of find a halfway solution. Uh, the th third thing what we need is uh, what I think Fabio alluded to is a lot of these large investors uh, want to invest at scale. You know, you talk to a large pension fund, they're not interested in 10, 15, $15 million investments. They're looking at three, five hundred million. Those do not exist in emerging markets, other than maybe a little bit in China, India, potentially a few countries. So therefore, we have to really start thinking innovatively on how do we, like Fabio said, pull in these assets, securitizations. So I'll talk about that later, but there is a lot of work that we are doing where we think we can help attract some of this global capital into our markets. Excellent. Thank you. Ellen? Yeah, I think I would complement what Vivek was saying with uh, working with the financial systems domestically. At least we see in, in, um, in Latin America, we see that, of course, most of this mobilization occurs in investment-grade countries. As, as Vivek was pointing, that, that's one of the, the issues. They're not necessarily looking at the technology, they're looking at the country. And so it's harder to mobilize resources there. We, we do focus on mobilizing. We did a record mobilization in 2021 but a lot of it goes to larger countries. So how do we manage to work in local countries? We're working with the financial sectors domestically, with banks, for example. And I think the point of the taxonomy is critical. Uh, we have learned a lot about working with the banks and they wanna know what the green investments are, but when we say, well, we also should support the transition to low carbon and resilient investments, they wanna know what that means. And having an amber taxonomy, as uh, the European Union calls it, is very useful. And we're actually working in Chile with some of the banks and the associations to try to create that amber taxonomy, to be able to replicate decarbonization projects that we did with a specific sponsor, for example, in Chile. Great. Great. Well, we're going to get into all of these specific things. Um, 
But I, I just, I want to, one thing that struck me about the report, as I was saying, it synthesized so much and really covered all of the different approaches when it comes to uh, financing mechanisms. And I wondered, you know, before we get into those details, if you could just, Fabio, talk a little bit about the overall change in the macro policy and investment climate that you talked about and you alluded to. What is, from a very high level, what do you need to see change? And then we'll talk about some of the specific mechanisms, et cetera, that, that can help get yeah, there. So maybe let me start with the flows. I think an important point that it's, it's crucial to make here that we usually talk about emerging markets as uh, one group, right? But there's a lot of diversity within the group. So if you look at like sustainability debt issuance, that's a broader concept than just climate, but just for, 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 uh, for, for uh, pur expositional purposes here. So there was a, 2021 was like a record high issuance. It was about $200 billion uh, issuance. That's about 40% of this stock outstanding in just one year. Mm -hmm. uh, equity, it's a little bit less. It was only $25 billion, But again, the stock is 150 so that's a significant number, right? But there's a lot of diversity inside that in terms of countries. Some countries issue much more than others. Uh, Chile, for example, it's a good example. Uh, there's a lot of diversity in terms of instrument they use, right? Some countries, it's, it's a lot of issuance of green bonds. In other countries, more sustainability bonds. Other countries use more sustainability linked issues, where there's essentially there's a link to the outcome of these products. Uh, there's a huge difference in terms of currency, for example. The predominant currency has been dollar for a while. Uh, China is a large issuer here. When you move to other countries, there's been an increase in non-dollar issuance, for example. That allows you also to broaden the investor base. There's a huge difference in terms of, for example, uh, who's, who's issuing, right? So it starts with financial, but corporates are starting to issue much more. There's a difference across emerging markets in terms of like ownership, right? It started with more government-owned entities, but now it's broadening through the private sector. So I think there's diversity in terms of financial instrument, issuer, currency usage. That it's a plus because it allows to actually to bring in a broader set of investors with different risk profile investment, risk for different time horizon. Now, of course, they want to have, ideally, you want to have the right macroeconomic policies in place and the right climate policies in place. So I think that's, in terms of economic, the uh, climate policies, if you want. I mentioned carbon pricing. It's important to have to price carbon. Or carbon pricing, ideally, would be the best way as an economist. This is how you would price carbon. <laughs> and also realize that the world is a complicated beast. And so sometimes you need to go for the second best or the third best. So different countries have different approaches. And it's important to complement this and think about it in an in entirety if you want. Uh, there are different legal institutional systems. So ideally, yes, you want to have carbon pricing. Uh, macroeconomic policy is important, right? When investors come into emerging markets, specifically if you want to go beyond the large investment grade, uh, there are issues related to political risks, to legal certainty, institutional challenges. Uh, so that's, in some sense, another piece that it's needed to have the right investment uh, uh, climate, uh, the investment environment that you want to set in place to attract capital. I mentioned the IMF role uh, at the beginning when I was trying to summarize the report. I think the new resilience and sustainability trust could be an important uh, piece of this. The, this is essentially a facility that is going to be directed to, to our poorest countries. So it could cover about three quarters or 75 percent of the IMF members. It's meant to address long-term macroeconomic challenges to stability of balance of payments and build resilience as it relates to pandemic as well as climate. Right? So essentially, it's long-term financing, 20 years, at modest spread over uh, three months SDR, so low financing rate. And it's a way to catalyze, essentially, structural reform that build resilience They could be related, in this case, to climate. Uh, I also, you can think of this even more beyond this. It can be also one way, also a way to attract and become a catalytic source of private capital, right? So not just the fund uh, investment or the fund lending, but it comes, could be a role to attract both MDB's money, uh, bilateral private and public money, as well as private money. So, and I would add to that that the fund could, in fact, take the lead in terms of the climate in architecture. So in terms of requiring transparency in data, higher quality data, uh, like taxonomies, for example, as well as global disclosure. So I think it can be, cut, again, catalytic role in terms of attracting capital, setting in place the right macroeconomic policy to build resilience, as well as work on improving the investment climate from the data and taxonomy side. Right, right. A lot of, a lot of different elements there. Let's just talk specifically about some of the uh, uh, promising, innovative uh, instruments that might be able to, to catalyze this. Vivek, I don't, this is something that you think a lot about. What do you see that's most promising? What's most exciting to you? 
So I'll get into what's promising and exciting, but I also would like to dwell a few minutes on what's desperately needed. And uh, let's start with what's already happening, green bonds, green loans, blue bonds more recently. Uh, you know, we've done almost a billion dollars over the past uh, two years now and in emerging markets. Sustainability linked bonds, as Fabio said, and I think the next thing that we have to introduce very quickly, which we're working on, is transition bonds. Mm -hmm. uh, what you call amber, we are calling transition, and that is really absolutely critical because if we are to decarbonize steel and cement, it's not an on-off switch. Putting up a solar plant is green from day one, but how do you take a heavily emitting sector, steel, cement, fertilizer, and that's going to be a five, seven, ten year process. So that's, that's transition finance. So we're working on that and we're hoping to be launching it very soon at COP. Uh, the other area is what we alluded to earlier is how do you aggregate assets, securitizing existing pools. So we're working on that there. Now that's a little more complicated because it could involve cross-border issues. You have to have consistency, but then it also offers you diversification. So we are working quite a bit and we've done a little bit of work and a few small deals in that. But that's another financial instrument and that is how you can link some of these global institutional investors that want to invest at scale on the debt side. That, so that's one thing you know, that we need to focus on. I just want to dwell on something because we always talk about hard currencies. Hard currencies, if you take debt, come with currency risk. And we cannot forget the importance of the domestic financial sector. The domestic financial sector, how do you connect domestic savings, domestic pensions into climate, I think is just as important. Mm. Because that's how you're going to really green the economy as a whole. Because the large funds and the large MDBs, we don't have the capacity to go SME by SME. And that's what, 60% of an economy? So I just want to leave that thought that we cannot ignore the domestic financial sector and really we have to work on how do you connect domestic savings into climate over time. Well, I, I want to get to Helen in just a second, but I, I want to follow up on that because that's interesting. What is the mechanism to get the domestic financial sector involved? Is it just a question of capacity building? How do you, how do, you do that? Are you seeing promising examples? So we've seen some promising examples. We've started work in a few markets in Latin America and Asia, and it's, it's a process. It's a five-year process. You go out by doing advisory. It's about building capacity. It's about helping countries develop taxonomies. It's about education. A lot of it is, you know, it's really interesting. We did a green bond in the Philippines, $150 million, and the client kept saying, oh, I don't have green assets. Two months later in February, she said, I have another 500 million. I did not know I was doing so much green finance. So just getting them to understand that, I think, is critical. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a whole process. So we have to develop taxonomies, work with the governments, work with the central banks, work with the regulators, and work with the clients themselves for them to be able to see this. And you may need some amount of blended finance because you know, when you're connecting pension money into climate, there's a perceived risk. So you need some amount of blended finance to de-risk that. And, uh, but it's a process that we have to start, and it has to be country by country. But also we have to leverage institutions like the NGFS to make it happen, really. Great. Well, Helen, I, I know you wanted to talk a bit about a specific example uh, of your work uh, in Uruguay. Um, I don't know if that's Yeah, I, I think that the, the point that Fabio was making of linking climate policies and, and basically financing is critical. And I think the example of the recently launched uh, sovereign sustainability linked bond in Uruguay last week, it's, it's a critical example because it shows how the government is connecting a sovereign loan to the achievement of the NDC, which is something quite unique and, and innovative, and hopefully many other countries will, will continue and replicate that. And it's not only, I mean, sovereign loans or sustainability loans or uh, bonds we have seen before in Chile, for example, but the interesting thing about Uruguay is it links it to two KPIs. One has to do with GAG emission reductions. The other one has to do with conservation of forests. But the interesting is that it, it does not only have a step up, it has also a step down, which is unique. It's the first time we, we are seeing a, sustainability, a sovereign sustainability linked bond with a step down. Basically, the investors are recognizing all the effort that needs to be linked to, to to achieve those, those um, actions. And how IDB is working, or the IDB group is working with Uruguay in this case, is that we are also supporting in designing the plan, the pipeline of projects that will come to support the reduction of emissions in Uruguay. And also the private sector will enter later on with specific investments. So it's a, it's a whole program that starts with a government that is committed to, to green finance, that looks to use a sovereign instrument to attract and to link 
their financing with NDCs, which is what Fabio was just mentioning. Yeah, linking uh, uh, finance with, with NDCs, that's pretty remarkable. And I think uh, a lot of people who asked, what do these NDCs really mean? This is a concrete way to, to have some uh, form of return and accountability there. I, I want to talk about standardization, about taxonomies. Um, obviously, this is an important uh, topic given the many competing taxonomies. Um, very broadly, how do you approach standardization? Um, let's, I'll start with Fabio. Yeah, so I had the privilege of co-chairing an NGFS workstream on climate data. Um, and so we looked at the what's available in terms of like what's available in terms of data, looking at the needs of a bunch of stakeholders, right? So we essentially created seven uh, categories of stakeholder, and we look at use cases, right? So if you are, for example, a central bank and you need data for financial stability purposes and trust testing, right? Those are your needs. Then what is available in terms of data? And so implicitly identifying the gaps on the data. Um, and there were three kind of like challenges. One was related to availability, right? So actually having access to data, actually have granular data, a good coverage of data. Another has to do with reliability. You need quality data. Uh, you need data that can be verified, for example, right? And then there's the issue of comparability. Those are global markets. Eventually, you want to be able to compare uh, data across countries. And so then the question was like, how do we close this gap? And we came up with, we linked essentially closing the gap to some of this issue related to standardization. One is we need some sort of like common language when we talk about taxonomy, so classification for alignment purposes. Um, and so we are working with the, uh, the World Bank, uh, with the OECD and BIS to come up with general principle for sustainable finance alignment with the, un, under the G20 Sustainable Finance Working Group. The idea is to create some sort of umbrella that is going to be able to include both jurisdictions like Europe that has gone into the taxonomies, uh, very, has been there and working on this for many years, uh, but also jurisdictions, say, like the US, for example, where there's no public taxonomies and there's a lot of private taxonomy. There's more than 200 taxonomy between public and private. So we need some sort of standardization. So principle, it's one way, I think, to move in that direction. And we'll see how much convergence we can push for that. Then the other, part, the other uh, recommendation is standardization in terms of global disclosure. Right? You need global disclosure. Uh, in some sense, if you want to attract global investor, this is one way to avoid the fragmentation, both of capital markets as well as the regulatory approach. So it's crucial that we come up with some global standards, and the effort by the IFRS and the International Sustainability Standard Board, I think, is in the right direction to create some global, uh, global standards. Like, let, let me end with one point, though. Even if you have perfect global standard, even if you have the perfect taxonomy, if you don't have good quality data, if data cannot be compared, that is, remains a huge challenge. So I think we need to start with the data. We need to start have good quality, comparable data that people can actually have a good sense of what the impact of their investment are. Uh, that, to me, is the starting point. On that, you build then and you build into these taxonomies. And again, the transition taxonomy is crucial for emerging markets. And a lot of that stuff is neither green nor brown. It's in the middle and you want to set up the right incentive to become a little bit greener over time. Um, and the point we have made, it's very important. There are sectors where you can't go from brown to green overnight, and there are sectors that are crucial for the economic development of countries, like cement is, is a good example. Uh, and so how do you make, create incentives so that that sector become green, more green over time in a way that it's financially viable and they can attract essentially private capital? Very interesting. I, I would be curious to hear uh, a, a little bit more about how you facilitate uh, that climate information architecture. That how do you actually uh, enable uh, emerging markets, emerging developing countries, to have access or to uh, to, to, to to find that data? I mean, what what is the mechanism for doing that? I mean, so the way we what the the ultimate result of the NGFS work stream was what we call a data directory. Essentially, it's a Think about it like a catalog where you can go in and say, again, based on this, who you are and the case studies, what data are available. And the idea is that this is a public good. Uh, we're trying to find the final housing, and then we plan to update this periodically. And that could be one easy way, one, to track and monitor progress on the data front, but also set up incentive for people to actually come up with new data, participate into this process, so that this is, again, it's a public good, it's available to everyone. There are always going to be commercial data, obviously. We are aware that this is not going to become public overnight. Uh, but how to bring and build on some of this initiative and use this initiative to make data more available to a broader set of, 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 of people. Now, one last point. I think also we don't want to go for perfection right away. Right? If it's the goal, it's perfection. We're never going to get there. So it's important to build also on what we have now. 
In particular, I want to mention the use of technology. There is a lot of technology out there that can actually improve access to data and quality of data, whether this is artificial intelligence, machine learning, blockchain and digitalization, for example, uh, as well as there's a lot of open source approach to this. And I think open source can be another way to actually improve the quality of data, but also the availability and access to data. And this is crucial for emerging markets, right? They, they need data, and we need to speed up the process. Yeah, what a, what a game changer artificial intelligence has been for, for understanding what's happening on the ground. Vivek, I, I want to ask just what, your, from your vantage point, uh, how the taxonomies, uh, uh, the competing taxonomies right now are playing out on the ground, um, you know, and, and, and do you have any additional thoughts that you might add to Fabio's points? Yes, yeah, so a couple of points. I mean, I just wanted to again reiterate the point that Fabio made on the importance of data and using AI and blockchain and things like that. And that started to happen uh, I think the World Bank issued a blue loan many years ago in Australia using blockchain. So that's, that is happening. But I, I think what I really wanted to pick up on what you said, there are so many competing taxonomies today. Uh, you know, it's very interesting. We don't have a green bond standard to the best of my knowledge. We have guidelines. We have principles. Now, you can interpret a principle one way. She can. I can. We can all interpret a principle differently. And I think ultimately we have to move towards a standard so that an investor sitting in country X investing it has an option to invest in seven different green bonds he or she knows exactly what he or she is getting into and i am saying so i agree with fabio that we can't go and be perfect perfect right now but i think the sooner we start getting there the better it's going to be for all of us because the last thing you want is i had three options i invested in a green bond and i find it wasn't as green as the other two so i'm going as far ahead and saying you know you can have different levels of green bonds one star two star three star whatever but we have to have a standard. You know, when you have an accounting standard, you can compare your audited statements to that standard. And until we have a standard, it's a principle. It's, you know, it can be interpreted differently. And if you really want to attract capital at scale and you don't want scandals around greenwashing, I think this is going to be one way to do it, coupled with the fact that you need accurate data and transparency. So I would really want to get us to start moving towards a real standard. And like I said, in, us, in emerging markets, you may not be able to meet that certain standard. So you can have different grades of green and blue bonds. That's perfectly fine. But at least people know what they're getting into. And I, I think that is important. The second thing I wanted to pick up is in transition finance. So very interesting conversations that we've had with a very old client of the IFC who says, I'm very happy to do everything you're doing on transition. This is a large steel company. But if steel prices fall by 30%, my cash flows get squeezed, what am I going to do? Do I keep my operations running and pay my suppliers and my uh, staff? Or do I continue doing decarbonization because I've committed that to you? So we have to take into account these kind of things when we are doing transition finance. We need to make sure that people understand this is what it means. Because things happen which you don't anticipate. Yet. So, you know, it's really important when we look at transition finance because without that, there's absolutely no way. I think we're going to get to 1.5 degrees. But we have to give them the flexibility and the time to make it happen. Otherwise, what's going to happen is you're going to ignore a large part of the emitters. And, you know, that's fine. We can have everything else green. But then if your steel and cement are not green, you've got a problem. So I think we need, when we are building some of these standards or taxonomies in transition, we have to make, make sure that we take into account that firstly, it's not one size fits all because it's about different companies have different levels of emission today. So how do you reduce them? So it's not an absolute number. It's really about taking it case by case. So that's the one place I would probably say you can't have a real hard standard today. You have to go more by a case by case. But factoring into account that markets evolve, markets change, markets are volatile is going to be important. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Well, uh, Ellen, I, I want to just ask taxonomies, how is that discussion yeah. playing out in Latin America? I actually wanted to react to Perfect. The two of the points that they mentioned. Um, one, when you talked about data and, and commercial data, uh, maybe to bring the example that when we talk with clients in the region in Latin America, there is quite a lot of um, reticence to share data. Uh, I think that the, the culture of disclosure needs to be shared and, and raise awareness among our clients. And we basically see different types of clients. We, we can tear up you know, in different levels of sophistications, if you will, of clients that 
probably they, they are ready, they know the capital markets, the international capital markets, and they will disclose and they know that that has a benefit. And other ones that are, you know, just starting in this sustainability journey. And so knowing and understanding where each client is and specifically linking to where they are in the transition is also very important. So that, that was one point that I wanted to make. And the second point, and you raised the issue of the standards, I think we should not forget also of the impacts of the green bonds. That's why we created the, the Green Bond Transparency Platform for Latin America, where we basically track 80% of the bonds right now of Latin America because we want to know there is no greenwashing, that we want to know that there is actually reduction of emissions that driven by these projects. I think the problem is that sometimes we focus a lot initially on the basically the input, you know, putting money out there, but we don't track the output, the actual impact of emission reduction, and I think that's a very important point. If I can we... jump in on the transparency, because I think it's an important point for EMS, right? So we looked then into the ESG transparency um, and disclosure, right? So you see clearly that emerging markets that the disclosure is much less prominent than advanced economies, first of all. Mm -hmm. So there's work that needs to be done there. Then when you look at the different component, the environmental part is the one that is even less disclosure in emerging markets compared to advanced economies. And there's also a quite clear relationship between the scoring on the E and the credit worthiness, if you want, and so on. Mm -hmm. So that it's a little concerning because essentially implies that there is a bias in non-disclosure, right? If you have a lower score, you don't disclose, which means if you have issues about financial stability risk here or in terms of opportunities, there could be more that we're just not seeing because there's bias into the disclosure. That's why global disclosure, I think, is so important because it's sort of like level the playing field, if you want, in terms for global investors. So they're allowed to use similar definition, mm -hmm. think about definition of green bonds or other instruments, and also allow you to compare across countries, across emerging markets, countries, across opportunities, across the forward-looking transition path, for example. But again, you need to have data. If you don't have the right data, then there's not much, and it's unclear exactly what you are disclosing. We looked into the data, for example, with the NGFS, we looked at um, in terms of, of what kind of data get disclosed, right? So particularly for greenhouse emission. And 50% of those data that get released, now this is broader, not just emerging markets, but it's either unknown sorts of data, it's either estimated or come from modeling which means essentially for half of it, it's really not clear what those data are. So progress on this front, I think, is crucial to link it to, it again, to the disclosure as well as the transition uh, taxonomies as well. Well, maybe that's a good segue just to talk about ESG uh, broadly and, uh, you know, the, the metrics used for ESG and, and the, the report makes very clear uh, the challenges that emerging markets have in accessing uh, that capital. Uh, which is you know, intuitive in many ways, but I, the report said it very clearly. I, I guess I would just ask if you would reflect on, on, on that. What are the challenges and you know, is there any possibility uh, of bridging that or is there just, you know, as we were been t discussing, entirely different mechanisms, structures, taxonomies needed to, 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 uh, to finance? I think that what the report shows essentially is that if you look at the, uh, the ESG ratings you want across firms, there's, there's, uh, the, the distribution is much lower for emerging markets than advanced economies. Essentially, they get somewhat lower ESG uh, ratings. And we try to control for a number of the factors that could account for. But you could argue that, for example, I don't know, it's the size of the firms, right? Advanced economies have large size. The, the size of the firms is larger. That gives you higher rating. And that's not what it is. Uh, so there is that issue of lower ESG ratings. Uh, the other issue we, we look at is that the share of ESG fund allocated into emerging market is very small. So essentially, even if you are within funds that they are, if you want, dedicated to uh, ESG uh, goals, the, it's a very small share that gets allocated to emerging markets. So this is the point of need for scaling up uh, private finance into these countries. Great. Well, I, I want to shift gears uh, a little bit just to talk Pretty, probably pretty briefly, but about adaptation. Um, adaptation is featured throughout the report. It's not sort of the central focal point, but of course adaptation is very important in the ongoing sort of global discussions about finance uh, for emerging markets because it's hard to generate a return for adaptation. It's hard to, uh, to, uh, to structure it the same way as you might structure other projects. So I just reflect maybe, and Ellen, we'll ta start with you, and, and just if you could share a bit about how you think about adaptation in this context. Yeah, I was... I was going to jump and, and react also to Fabio's point of the ESG funds because generally when you talk about the ESG funds, 
and you talk to one of these you know, big fund managers and ask them, you have a climate or you have a gender or you have a, a, another environmental um, target, they rarely have adaptation as one of their, their priorities. And I think it's important for the region, at least for Latin America and the Caribbean, that they do have uh, some understanding. But when you, when you start talking to them, you realize they, having a specific indicator as you have with GHG emission reductions with adaptation is not the same. It's, adaptation is very localized. It depends on the, of the impacts of climate in the specific place. And so that creates a little bit more difficulties for, for these global funds to understand why they're doing or investing in adaptation. So I think that many times, at least in the, in the private sector, when you look at adaptation finance, just looking at the adaptation finance may be misleading because you know, you do a road and you include some adaptation components. And so by including those adaptation components, that's not the whole project on adaptation, at least for, for the private sector. It's just a, a small percentage of the adaptation finance. And so what you end up having is that you skew the, the, the importance of having these types of investments in adaptation because also the private sector does not value it or rating agencies do not price that properly to include or attract more, more resources for adaptation. When we talk to clients and you say, oh, why don't you do this adaptation measure from the beginning? They say because there is not a clear uh, return on that. Um, so for adaptation, I think that what we have done is, or we're thinking about it, and we're publishing a paper now for, for COP, is that we have to think of current instruments that will basically allow us to promote more adaptation in the region. And what I mean is that sometimes there is a lag between having the information on what the specific investments you have to do and being able to, to finance it. And so that's why we're trying to test different models with already existing instruments within our toolbox of instruments to, to finance adaptation. But I'm sure that um, Vivek can uh, complement this because we have had conversations among MDBs around uh, the issue of adaptation and making assets resilient. <laughs> Please. Yeah, so I think first I completely agree with you that we have to stop measuring the dollars and cents going to adaptation because I don't think that makes any sense. You build a $300 billion road and you spend $3 million in making it resistant to heat or floods. So you put $3 million into adaptation, but the reality is you've made a $300 million asset resilient. What's even worse is if you should do what we should all be doing is getting in a design stage and making that asset resilient from day one, you may be putting zero extra dollars into it. You just may be changing the location of a solar park, for example. So then you're saying, you actually, I put no money into adaptation, which is completely nonsense because in reality, you have made an asset resilient. So that's, I think, the overarching the thing I wanted to mention. Then we start to look at adaptation. I think maybe you need to change the, text, the, the word adaptation because it has different connotations. The way I want to position this is, let's talk to banks. How much money have they lost because of the hurricanes in, or the typhoons in Florida or the Philippines or the flooding in Pakistan or the droughts that we've experienced in different parts of the world? I think we have to start looking at adaptation and resilience through a climate risk lens. What is the financial loss? Because still three years ago, people didn't talk about it. And they started talking a little more. Now it's more about risk. What happens to my portfolio? Okay. So I think it's gaining traction. So the way we are trying to look at it is it's really in Two, two ways. You can look at it asset by asset. So we are financing an asset. We have tools that we've developed, a building resilience index, a GeoView tool, which will tell you this particular asset is going to be exposed to these climate risks based on different modeling assumptions that we made in the next 5, 7, 10, even up to, I think, uh, 25, 30 years. Then you can say, okay, this is how we make this asset, if it's possible, resilient to some of these risks. So that's at an asset by asset. The second way is when you have supply chains, which may be impacted by drought. If you're an agricultural company, you want to know where your primary agricultural products are coming from and what's the probability of a drought or a flood there, because that's going to really mess up your supply chains if you haven't got that figured out. And then third is at a community level. So at a community level, for example, what I'm trying to do is say, if Water levels are rising and there's a fishing community by the coast. You can build a seawall there, but the private sector won't invest in it because there are no returns there. But if you go to a coastal community where there are 30 hotels and it's dependent on tourism, 
There you can build a seawall through a PPP structure because those 30 hotels will hopefully pay for it because otherwise their business is going to get hit over the years. So a lot of work going on. It's early stages and I know there's a lot of pressure for us on the private sector to move fast and we want to move fast. But I think we have to look at doing it a bit differently the way that it's looked at in the past. You know, one favorite thing of mine is strong water drainages in uh, municipalities or cities. Yeah. You know, you could have a source of revenue coming in from there where the, the population pays because they've all seen the impacts of floods. Yeah. So attracting capital is a little hard, and what we need is to come up with new and innovative structures, potentially PPPs are one area. Uh, climate risk insurance, we're going to come out with our first parametric product very soon, hopefully. So these are different ways that we are going to be able to address the risk of climate, or the, sorry, the, the whole issue of climate risk. Uh, but are we going to see capital flowing the way we've seen in mitigation, private capital? I don't know. A lot of this is for the public sector. It is a public good, and therefore it is for the public sector. Thanks. Uh, yeah, the report touches on that same theme. I don't know if you want yeah, to tell us. I was going to add maybe briefly a couple of things. I think, one, we often look at adaptation versus mitigation in a binary way, right? It's one or the other. And I think in some countries it's obvious when they get hit by such extreme uh, weather events, for example, that the two overlaps quite clearly. Mm -hmm. That you can only, when you think about adaptation, you're effectively thinking about mitigation too. In other words, say if you're not resilient, you're not resilient to physical risk, but you can't also move toward the transition. So we should probably not think of the two as two different categories. The second aspect I think direct touch upon is I think we need to look at the social aspect of this, of what is called just transition. Mm -hmm. There's a huge impact in emerging markets, as particularly poor country in, in localities, in communities. And so I think you really need to think what the impact are also on this community. You need to buy in from the local communities. That's the best way to move this forward, or, uh, uh, not only with speed, but also to make sure that address some of the challenges that we obviously create when you start changing the business model and some of the structure. So the just part of the transition, I think it's something that we really need to keep in mind, even when we try to bring in private capital into this. And there are some funds, the impact funds, that really care about what the impact is. Or, uh, but so it's important, again, go back to the data. To, the only way to measure impact, though, if you can actually have the data to measure the impact. But the just part, I think, sometimes gets lost in the discussion, but I think it's important to emphasize that. Yeah, so I wanted to come back on one thing. I agree with you entirely on the just part and how do we do that. You know, so that's that's the, uh, that's that's absolutely critical. The other thing, you know, it's very interesting. When there is a natural disaster, after a natural disaster, a lot of aid flows in. Now, why can we not get that aid in before that natural disaster occurs and make the low-income housing resilient to flooding or typhoons or whatever the particular? Because I think now we've got it mapped out reasonably well on what is climate risk in some of these areas. So I think we have to really start thinking differently about. There is a pool of capital that will come in post the disaster because you're actually destroying livelihoods. You know, if you are a fisherman on the coastal, you know, in Philippines, or you have a small shop house, you get hit by tornadoes or typhoons three times a year. Every time you have to rebuild. But if you can build your house or your business and make it resilient to that climate risk with some amount of blended finance or donor money, which is going to come in after the event, hopefully. So you get it before the event. What that does is it will make your asset resilient to these risks. Because it's resilient to these risks, hopefully you can get insurance for it. And if you can get insurance for it, hopefully you can get a mortgage for it. So, you know, we have to start thinking of different models to try and see how to help with this. And there, I would, yes, I would just add the, the, there is also a, an option of adding a climate clause, for example, when you talk with agribusinesses. You know, you want to do a, an investment, and if you add a, and you see a risk of, of potential climate impacts there, you can add a climate clause like we are doing in Peru and Argentina, that if there is a national disaster, the private sector client will have some time to recover and they have a timing of just basically stopping to, to do repayments on interest or the capital. So that, or the principal. And, that, and that's an important issue because that allows the economy to recover after a disaster. Great, great. Well, I, let's, let's maybe shift gears a little bit. I, I, we've talked about sort of different mechanisms uh, in, you know, uh, as they came up in the conversation. I, I just wanted to maybe talk about a few specifically. Um, and, and first, I actually just wanted to talk about, about the opportunity for securitization. And that's something that's come up. Um, how, does, how do you do that? You know, what is the best avenue to, to securitize uh, some of these projects? 
Uh, maybe Vivek, you, I think you mentioned that. Uh, maybe we'll start with you and get some other thoughts. Yeah, so I think, you know, the whole idea is that till recently, commercial bank debt, there was a lot of liquidity, interest rates were low, banks had plenty of capital. So lending 20 year for a solar farm, people were doing it quite easily. Uh, what's happened since in the last year or year and a half is interest rates have gone up, liquidity is tightened. I don't think, I, I don't think banks are going to be willing to do 20, 25 year debt because the capital charge is going to be high. At the same time, what's happening is because interest rates are going up, uh, your financing cost goes up, so your tariffs have to be impacted. And prices of panels have also been going up. So the thinking is, which, which is not rocket science, it's been done, is how do you create two asset classes, a construction risk asset class and an operating risk. Construction risk is best dealt with by commercial banks. They know project finance, they know construction, they know early stage operating risk. The funds or the institutional investors do not want to take construction risk. They don't understand construction. They're not interested in land acquisition. They want a steady stream of cash flows over time. So the whole point is if you can get a bunch of assets which banks finance, and then once you've de-risked it for land acquisition, construction, and early stage operating risk, you put it in an SPV or a pool, and then you do a credit rating, and maybe you have to uh, you know, put a credit wrap around it or some sort of support, okay, make it investment grade and investable, and then you get these global funds and the institutional investors to come in. So that's sort of the big picture. Now, this can be done at three different levels. It can be done at a firm level. You can have a large firm that has a large portfolio of solar assets in one country. You can do it in one country because that's a little easier because the PPAs are probably similar in one country. In an ideal scenario, what I'd love to do is to do it across a, a continent or across the world where you have a few assets from Brazil, from Chile, from India, from Philippines, from Vietnam. That's a little more complicated because jurisdictionally you run into all those issues. But the big benefit of that is you get diversification. See, what investors want, which always helps you in a notch to get your credit rating above, higher, is diversification. So single asset, single country, no diversification. So that's something you have to then sort of discuss the pros and cons. So we're working on a couple of these now. But I think this will be a great way for us to get what Fabio talked about, this big pot of money that's out there that wants to come into climate. But today, they do not have the means to come in. So that's really how I think we can connect this large pool of money into climate and emerging markets. OK, well, I just want to ask one follow-up, because that seems so interesting and so important. Is who, who is it who's going to be the, the entity that, that looks across you know, the different geographies to come up with that, with that, with that, uh, that uh, security? Because that's such a uh, challenging task, as you said. So that's the most challenging task. Uh, I'm not a very ambitious guy. <laughs> but I'm starting out with saying, can we do it in one country? But then we're also looking at where we have similar pools. I think the whole thing is, you know, you can't have a PPA out of a country which, where there's no termination compensation and other, because then it gets hard to get a credit rating. So to really start out and see where there are similar PPAs, so we started something called Scaling Solar in Africa a few years ago, where the PPAs are pretty much identical. So there at least you know that the legal agreements are identical. Now, behavior issues are different. How will governments behave? But there also you can sort of get to it. You know, you can see where is the cost curve right now? Where is your tariff, the assets that you're putting into this pool? You know, obviously, if you're right at the top of the cost curve in terms of tariffs, the probability of problems is much higher. So those are the kind of things that we're looking at there. But we are doing a lot of this work right now as we speak. Great. Do you want to come yeah, in? Yeah, sure. I think that securization model is the one that has been widely used in advanced economies, right? It's done for, I don't know, asset-backed securities, for credit card, in, just speaking the US, uh, for auto loans, it's done for commercial banking loans. So the structure is well known. The issue is how do you apply that structure to emerging markets? The big advantage is if you essentially splice risk, you can bring different form of capital, right? If you have particularly different tranches, you can bring different private investors with different risk profile, with different investment horizon. So that allows to bring in and scale up that private capital we were discussing. Now, the way one other advantage is that you can actually lever up the equity part, right? So you can bring in more private capital based on what is the leverage that is built into the structure. The big question is who takes the equity risk, right? So I think that's where the big discussion is and how do you apply this to emerging market. And that's where I think the role of MDBs is crucial because that position is not going to be taken by the private sector. You can think of some structure blended finance where it's private and public, but clearly the public role, there is a public role, important public role for MDBs there. Again, 
Right now, the on average, for one dollar of public money that goes into this, some of this project, you get one dollar of private capital. At this scale and pace, we're never going to get to the objective of, of, of reduction of greenhouse emissions. So we need to lever up, and we need yeah. to get for one dollar of public money, you need much more private capital brought in. So those structures are conducive to that. The question is equity. Who takes the equity position? And I think that's why, again, the role of MDBs is crucial, because MDBs can, one, help on the project selection, so capacity building, for example, technical assistance. They can help with coming up with innovative instruments. They've been on the front line of this. But also, they can play a role in that equity position. And some of it has been done in the past with credit guarantees. I think we need to move into more into the equity uh, building. And so you need, ideally, more balance sheet allocated to MDBs, so advanced economies should put more money. But also, you need to more, better use the money that is available and levering this up. And that's where the risk absorption, absorption role of MDBs have is crucial. And then you have seen in the last few days, there's been already a debate going into the annual meetings here about the role of the multilateral development bank, how much capital they need, how much capital advanced economies can provide, and how to better, more efficiently use that capital. Just one very quick follow-up. You said one-to-one, -one, public to private. What should that ratio be? What can it be and what should it be? <laughs> what can it be? It's a tougher question. What yeah. ideally you want to be, I mean, if I want to dream, I would go to 10. Okay. Uh, but again, I'm into the, <laughs> the dreaming phase now. But I think you need to start from where you are, right? This is, again, as Vivek said, you can't go from here to the objective immediately. We need to be realistic of what can be done and work towards scaling this up. And so if we can move from one to two to three over time, I think I would, be, I would take that, that deal. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, Ellen, do you want to uh, come in uh, on this question of securitization, if there's anything? No, I think that um, we have tested that as well in Latin America, but I think that the, the legal arrangements in each country varies quite a lot, and it, it creates a lot of, of work before you actually see the results. So there's a... There's a time lag. I, I completely agree that there's the potential of, of um, mobilizing more resources, but when you work with this type of products or projects, you have to know that this will take a couple of years. So it's not something that you start today and it's going to be done tomorrow, but it actually will take a couple of years to create the conditions within at least one country, not to say the world, but at least with one country to get the, the product right. Yeah. Yeah, so, you know, you know, I just want to touch upon what he said, and I'll share with you all what we've done, and I agree it takes time. We set up something called an MCPP, which is a platform for debt where we would raise, we would get projects, and these investors would automatically invest. It was sort of a, a pre-approved syndication kind of a platform. It took us almost two years to structure, so it take, these things take time, and uh, we launched the last version of it last year at COP, a $3 billion platform for Parasaline projects, and that's just gone operational. Uh, end of September, and that today is a $11.2 billion program. And there is some amount of blended finance in there because a lot of the commercial investors want an investment-grade product. So we do have some amount of first loss, which we've got. So there are pots of money for the equity piece in addition to our capital. Uh, I think there are philanthropies, there are, uh, you know, governments. So, you know, we have to look for it, but I, I think today people, I, this is my hope, is when you go to them with a structure like this, say we can leverage every dollar you give us, we can hopefully leverage five, six, seven, ultimately to ten. I'm hoping they'll be willing to give some of that to us. Great. Well, we, we have just a few minutes left, and so I figure what I'll do, I mean, we touched on a lot of different things, um, but not everything. So I just want to give each of you an opportunity with just a minute or two to say any closing thoughts, things that we didn't discuss that you might want to have uh, our viewers uh, uh, hear about. Um, so we'll start maybe with Fabio and then we'll come down the line. I think maybe I just want to highlight, we talked a lot about challenges here, but again, there's a lot of opportunities too, right? So this is, this country's need investment. They need to pay, we need to transition toward green economy, and this could be an opportunity to actually accelerate progress and development in this country, right? They can leapfrog and maybe uh, miss some of the steps that advanced economies had to do and just jump to a better point. So I wouldn't just come out of this discussion that there are these barriers, these challenges. There are also huge opportunities. And again, I will also maybe the call is to use the available sources, hopefully have more resources, but don't forget the social aspect of this. I think some of these changes maybe look great from a macro perspective, but at the level of communities and smaller micro, for some 
country from, from some of these communities can be very large change, very significant changes. So keep in mind that the social aspect I think is crucial. Excellent. Vivek, so very two things. Uh, sorry. Uh, one is the importance of do greening the domestic financial sector. I said it and I'll say it again and I'll keep saying it because without that, we're not going to be able to get where we want to, and people will get left out, SMEs will get left out, so that's absolutely critical. Second is I think we have to change the narrative, as Fabio said, from one of challenges to the opportunity. Climate is the biggest opportunity. We've done a report which talks about trillions of dollars of investment coming into decarbonization, into these new sectors that are going to be emerging. And I'll just end by saying, you know, a few years ago, I put up a chart of the top 10 companies on, I think it was the Dow or the NASDAQ, today and 30 years ago. There was only one company that was common over 20, 25 years. So I'm hoping in the next 25 years the same thing will happen is that you're going to have this new breed of technology-related companies, decarbonized companies or sectors that are decarbonized that will dominate the, the space, I think. Yeah. That's my hope. Yeah. Yes, opportunity. We should be talking about opportunity. Hillen, final word. So my, my final word would be that we also see the appetite from the private sector in the region, at least in Latin America and the Caribbean. People are, are eager to learn more. They want to be involved. Maybe they see the opportunity. They don't call it climate investment. They just see the opportunity. And so just providing the information, uh, raising awareness, sharing information across all these different actors can also support the, this uh, race to zero. Well, thank you, Helen, Vivek, Fabio. It was a great discussion. Thank you for joining us. Uh, and I would encourage you to read the report, which I found to be uh, uh, very insightful. Thank you again.